thanks for coming to hear about self-driving cars. So imagine for a minute, and I'm not just some guy, I'm, I'm Carl Benz, I'm the inventor of the modern automobile, um, and you had a chance to kind of have a conversation with me. What might you say? You might say, Carl, you know, this thing you're doing with the car, it's got legs. It's going to turn out in, in, a, you know, in a few years, maybe a hundred years, there'll be two cars for every house in America. It'll become the predominant form of transportation in the Western world. You know, we're going to reshape cities around your invention. It's literally going to change the world. I think you say, Carl, but, there's always a but. It turns out your invention is going to kill 1.2 million people every year. Uh, that the United States alone is going to waste $115 billion with people stuck in congestion as they try and move around. And that, you know, yeah, you've got a good thing going, but maybe there's something more we can do. And if I'm Carl, you know, I'm going to be pretty excited. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to have a real impact. But I'm also going to not necessarily sleep easily knowing some of the negative impacts of what I'm going to do. So, back to being me, some guy, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to try and do to help Carl be able to sleep at night. So it turns out self-driving cars are not a new idea. This is a magazine clip from 1956 from America's power companies, this was their ad, they were going to make electric vehicles that were driven by electricity, that would follow buried cables in the road, you'd wear your suit, go for a drive with your wife and kids, and play dominoes in your bubble mobile. It was fantastic. I love this vision. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little harder to do than we first thought. You know, it turns out there's this cost of burying stuff in the road. You know, you have this problem if you go to uh, Congress and say, guys, I'd like to make self-driving cars. Uh, I need you to build a special road for me. Congressman says, that's great, Chris. Uh, how many self-driving cars are there? I say, not, but there'll be a bunch in the future. He says, okay, thank you. Uh, so, so the infrastructure approach doesn't work, so we need to put intelligence in the cars. So for the last 50 years, really, we've been working on that to varying degrees. In 2001, Congress got excited. They said, you know what? Our men and women are dying in, in combat. We're going to put a mandate that a third of all of our vehicles in combat areas are going to be unmanned. That was exciting, right? We'd save lives. National Academy of Engineering said, you know, that's a great idea, guys, but we're not going to get there from here. So in 2003, the Defense Department announced a competition called the DARPA Grand Challenge. The idea was to drive a vehicle through the desert between Los Angeles and Las Vegas and have it do that completely unmanned. No midgets behind the wheel wrapped in aluminum foil, no remote controls, just have it go out and do this thing. So, in 2003, uh, I was a grad student at Carnegie Mellon University. I was part of a team, and we built this self-driving robotic Humvee. It had some great features. It could drive pretty quickly. It could park upside down. Uh, you know, it's, it was a very capable vehicle. Turns out that this was a, a disappointing day, you might say. Um, uh, ten days before the competition, we were pushing our vehicle as hard as we could in testing, and we managed to, you know, stick it rubber side up. Ten days later, through our army of grad students, we actually got the thing back together. We entered the competition. We actually qualified first. Uh, it was an amazing day, the first grand challenge. There was more helicopters in the sky than I've ever seen. These little things, you know, guys from the military hovering over, uh, above. Uh, there were more stars on uniforms than I'd seen before as well. And as our vehicle launched, this three-star general turned to his aide and said, you know, you sure there's nobody in that thing? Uh, and, and so that was pretty exciting. For those of you who know the Turing test, that's almost the automotive Turing test. Our vehicle took off and it looked great. You know, you can see the, the slightly deformed shark fin here running across the desert as it crashed through three or four gates, eventually got hung up on a berm, and almost literally caught on fire and smoke building everywhere. So we got about seven miles of the 150 miles they wanted us to drive. The press crucified us. They said, you know, geez, what are they playing at? They drove seven miles out of 150. What's going on? DARPA said, you know what? They did drive seven miles out of 150, but they drove it fast. They drove it okay. And we should do it again because they made a lot of progress. So a year later, sorry, a year later, we came back with two vehicles. <laughs> And true to form, 10 days before the competition, we took one of them and parked it rubber side up again. Uh, this time we got it back together. We qualified first and second with our vehicles. We got to race day, we went out, and a team from Stanford beat us. And uh, what was exciting, though, was that 
we had two vehicles finished, Stanford had a vehicle finished, two other teams finished. So we had five robots that drove 150 miles across the desert with nobody in them, nobody talking to them. So we got on our soapbox and we said, wow, this is exciting. You know, something's coming from this. So DARPA said, that's great. You can drive through the desert without bumping into too many things. We want to take you into a city and we want to have you drive around other vehicles, deal with traffic, stay on your side of the road, be able to park. And they came up with a competition called the Urban Challenge. This was a 60 mile race through an abandoned air base. What you're seeing in the video here is footage from our vehicle, it's called Boss, driving around. The things with the crap on the roof, those are the other robots. The cars that are breaking the rules, those are generally the human drivers that are out there to keep them safe. After 60 miles, our vehicle was able to finish the competition. Uh, turned out this time, we got a happy ending. We had the, uh, the giant novelty check and won the competition. Uh, but more importantly, there were five other teams that actually finished that day. You know, if one team finishes, right, it's an aberration, it's a freak, somebody got lucky. If six teams finishes, it means we have a piece of technology we can build from. And that was exciting. It was so exciting, in fact, that DARPA said, you know what? Problem solved. Uh, we're done with this. Somebody else go figure it, out, figure it out from here. And so we had this incredible amount of energy that went into this really focused competition. And then suddenly that, that energy dissipated. And it spread into other things, and the folks that were involved in the competition went on to do great things in other areas. But kind of self-driving cars lost a lot of the energy they had at the time in 2007. So in 2009, Google said, you know what? This self-driving car stuff is actually pretty cool. And it has an awful lot of potential to, to impact people's lives, to make the world a better place. And you know what? It's fundamentally a computer science project. So let's actually go out and try and do something about it. So before we did anything at Google, we set ourselves two kind of audacious goals. One was that we would drive 100,000 miles on public roads. This was an order of magnitude more testing than anyone had done before. The other was that we would pick 10 100 mile routes and we would ask the car to go from one end to the other of that route without anyone touching the steering wheel. And we do that in interesting places, not abandoned air bases, but we go through downtown San Francisco. In fact, many of the routes we picked, we kind of consider the dumbest ways you can drive from Mountain View to San Francisco. We went over the Santa Cruz Mountains and up the coast. We went along El Camino. For those of you who live in the area, you know driving from San Jose to San Francisco along El Camino with its 248 traffic lights is not the way you do it. But if you wanted to see if your son or daughter could drive well, you might put them there and just double your insurance for the trip. The other we did was we took the, the other trip route we took is up to Tahoe and had to drive around the lake. You know, we figured we we're going to spend a lot of time in the car making it work. Let's at least go do it somewhere scenic. So we picked these routes and let's see how we did. So we built a fleet of seven vehicles. These are our Priuses. And we took them out. We started by testing them on the freeways. So here we are driving on 101. We also, of course, had to test them on surface streets and interesting narrow roads, and we did that with traffic. That was an exciting moment. <laughs> uh, we tested it at night, and we dealt with you know, the, the things that occurred then. Uh, and the vehicles themselves are actually able to do pretty much everything a person can. So we can change lanes, we can see traffic lights, we can see pedestrians, but unlike a person, we actually can see 360 degrees around the vehicle, so we can see what's going on in the traffic near us. We took the vehicles out, we wanted to see how precisely they could drive, so we had them go through toll booths, and then we took them to really challenging places to drive. So this is Monterey, a seaside resort town near here. We had them drive along with the pedestrians stepping into the road, with vehicles stopping and pulling out, and then we took them to Lombard Street, the crookedest street <laughs> in the world. Also the street with the dumbest pedestrians in the world. Like, I don't know, like, even if it wasn't a self-driving car, what are you doing? Uh, and then we take them places like construction zones. It turns out that people have a hard time with construction zones. The merging, the short distances, we push them through this. And it turns out, at the end of about 18 months, we were able to drive more than 100,000 miles and complete our, our you know, 10, 100 mile goals, which was pretty exciting. So how did we do it? So this is one of our vehicles. Uh, this is what goes into it. There's a laser on the top. There's a radar on the front. There's a computer in the back that's the brains of the vehicle, obviously. And then, perhaps surprisingly, it still has four wheels. It's a car. Inside the vehicle, it looks an awful lot like a normal car. 
So we still have a steering wheel, brake pedal, and a gas pedal. A lot of people are kind of disappointed by that. Uh, when we're testing, we actually have two vehicles in the car at all times. We have a safety driver on the left, whose job it is that we don't bump into anyone, uh, you know, kind of keep the car and the world safe. And then we have a person on the right who's our software operator, and their job is to look at the telemetry coming from the car and give that safety driver a heads up and says, you know, hey, everything's cool and seeing everything, or, you know, by the way, Joe, we should, we should probably disengage it now because something just broke. Right? And so by the power of technology, we've now taken a car that used to take one person to drive it, and now required we have two. So progress is made. <laughs> All those people worried about robots and unemployment, like, <laughs> I haven't worked with robots. Uh, so how does the technology work? Fundamental to our technology is mapping. So here, we've, what you're looking at is a 3D model of Page Mill, which is a mountainous road near here. Uh, and as the car, we send a car out, we drive the route, we collect the data from that laser sensor on the roof, and we build a 3D model of the world, among other things. And what you're seeing is, as we're driving along, we, after we have that map, we compare what we saw last time to what we're seeing now, and from that, we can figure out, you know, that stuff that sticks up, we probably don't want to bump into that. That's moving. The other cool thing we can do with this data is we can compare what we, again, compare what we saw before and what we see now, and say, if the world, if, you know, match those two and figure out where the car is very precisely, actually to about 11 centimeters. What you're looking at the video here is the silver car is where we really were, and the gray box, that's where GPS told us we were. So we would have had a really exciting drive if we were just using GPS instead of doing this cool map matching laser technology stuff. Another cool thing that we can do is we can take just, you know, the, the difference of what we saw before, what's sticking up in the world, and we can figure out what that means. So here, what you're seeing is we're tracking cars on the freeway, and this guy, who's not going to be in the Jeep pool much longer on a motorbike, splitting lanes between our vehicle and the one next to it, and then as he proceeds, so he's the little cyan box you can see on the screen, zips between our car and the next one, and then continues on to zip between two or three more pairs of vehicles in front of us. So, you know, my hat's off to the dude, he can control a motorcycle, but I don't think, uh, I don't think he's going to get to exploit that skill for too long. Uh, what happens when you take this technology and move it downtown? So here what you're looking at is uh, an intersection of Palo Alto. The vehicle's pulled up to a stoplight. It's reading the state of the stoplight. You see the big red circle on the top uh, right of your screen. Sorry. Uh, it understands it should stop for the intersection. You can see it tracking the vehicles crossing in front of us in the magenta boxes. It pulls forward in the intersection to say, I'm going to make a left turn here. Comes to a stop and kneels for the two pedestrians you can see crossing the street. And then some guy decides, you know, okay, I do want to cross the street after all. Zips out in front and waits for him safely and then cross the street. So again, I don't know how many of you live in Palo Alto, but if you do, we thank you for helping us test the vehicle. <laughs> So this is a, an interesting situation. In the, in the robotics world, one of the things we worry about a lot is human-robot interaction. And the idea that when we're driving, there's a lot of subtle cues, right? That I make eye contact with you, from that you determine whether we're going to go first, and then you know, we kind of mentally negotiate and then one of us goes and we do the right thing. And we were worried about this because we figured, you know, all these robotics guys, they say this, you know, it, it's, you know we, we experience it. But it turns out in practice, a 2,000-pound, 4,000-pound automobile you know, is actually pretty good at signaling intent. And so what you're looking at here is a video of our vehicle dealing with a stop sign in the Presidio. And so as we come up to the stop, you'll see the car is looking in front of us. We see traffic moving through the intersection. The car obviously doesn't see quite as well as a person in this instance. It's now tracking all these vehicles moving through. You can see the kind of the hedgehog laser beams coming out from it. And then it sees a pickup truck cut in front of us. He's an SUV driver, they do that. We signaled to him where we're going, the other guys understood it. He has a little more uh, testosterone. He went first, we waited, and then we proceeded through the intersection. And it looked just like any other intersection traversal that you'll see a person do uh, in the Presidio, which is exciting. So at this point, you know, we have a bit of technology, it's kind of working. What are we going to do? Hands-free driving. Cars that park themselves. An unmanned car driven by a search engine company. We've seen that movie. It ends with robots harvesting our bodies for energy. This is the all new 2011 Dodge Charger, leader of the human resistance. I love that car. Uh, and it turns out when we were a 12 person team, 
team, you know, we're at Google, but we're really, we're a little small kind of startup-y flavored team within Google, 12 people, to see our work bashed by a national ad campaign from a major automotive supplier, that was, or automotive company, that was fantastic, right? That was validation that you can't get a lot of places. So, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, there we go. Data centers, that's actually our big play. We're gonna power data centers with human organs or whatever they say. So, uh, really, what we're about is improving people's lives, right? We want to take technology, we can make a self-driving car that moves, you know, has the, the most amazing technology in it. If you can't use it and it isn't valuable for something, why are we wasting our time? So this is a video we put together with a real person actually using our technology. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, off we go. Auto driving. Here we go. Here we go. Look, Mom, no hands. <laughs> no hands anywhere. No hands, no feet. No hands, no feet. <laughs> So it's Google, so we have to use this kind of music. So we're here at the stop sign. Yeah. Cars using radars and laser to, to check and make sure there's nothing coming right away. But five months left. Old habits die hard, man. They, they, they don't die. Hey, anybody up for a taco? Yeah, yeah. What do you want to, what do, you want to do today, Steve? I'm, I'm all for taco. Myself. All right, well, let's go get a taco. The drive through. Right, our big play is not data centers, it's tacos. There we go. Another people on here. Does anybody have any money? I've got one. No, I've got a lot of right here. You can roll down your window and order a burrito. Yes, I did. Yeah, very well. How are you today? This is some of the best driving I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 